Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, distinguished speakers, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us in person and virtually. As we say in Armenian, Bari Yekak. How's everyone feeling? <laughs> Welcome to the 2024 EBRD Annual Meeting and Business Forum's inaugural Digital Day here at the hub of innovation in Armenia at the TUMO Center for Creative Technologies in Yerevan. My name is Christina Ayanian, and I am honored to serve as your host for the day, and I invite you all to join me on a transformative journey as we dive through the digital age of today and tomorrow. We are making history today. Today, we stand at the crossroads of innovation, harnessing the power of digital technology that's shaping the future of finance where technology intersects with tradition to redefine the very fabric of our economic landscape. From blockchain to artificial intelligence, digital transformation is revolutionizing the way we bank, invest, and transact. As we gather here today, we bear witness to a seismic shift in the financial industry, a shift that's driven by innovation, propelled by necessity, and enriched by collaboration. Our esteemed panelists and speakers, representing a diverse array of expertise, will guide us through this dynamic landscape. From mobile payments to emerging markets to established institutions, we are here to seize the opportunities that lie before us. And we invite you to be an active part of today's discussions. You may submit your questions to the discussions using the QR codes on the screens beside me or by visiting slido.com and entering code 41258241. Once again, you can submit your questions using QR codes on the screen beside me or visiting slido.com and entering code 4125824. Thank you to the TUMO Center for hosting us for our inaugural Digital Day. And thank you to our prime sponsor, Aqua Bank, for sponsoring our Digital Day. And now, without further ado, let's take a look at how EBRD is reinventing the digital sphere of tomorrow. At the EBRD, we are committed to promoting digital. In 2021, we published the Digital Approach, which outlines our strategy for engaging with clients on digital investment opportunities and policy dialogue. Then we launched our Digital Hub, which coordinates our client-facing work, providing targeted and timely advice for investment projects with digital components. When it comes to working with clients, we have three focus areas, foundation, adaptation, and innovation. Foundation describes projects that aim to deliver the foundations of digital connectivity, things like developing policies that enable broadband rollout or supporting regulatory changes to enable competition. Adaptation broadly describes wider digital transformation projects, for example, investing in established players so they are not left behind. And innovation, we invest into digital-first clients like fintechs and other innovative startups. We also look to foster greater cybersecurity for our clients and the economies where we invest, to ensure that the EBRD region remains resilient in the face of growing digital risk. These are key steps to an equitable digital future across the EBRD regions. Digital transformation is paramount if the financial sector hopes to meet the rapidly evolving demands of the digital economy. We know there are huge changes taking place across the sector, but the benefits are unequally distributed and emerging markets risk falling further behind. Financial institutions like the local bank CBRD works with can play an important role in helping businesses digitalize. Right now, we have dedicated facilities of 360 million euros to support SMEs in Turkey and the Western Balkans and specialized credit lines that support women-led businesses in Central Asia, the Balkans and the Mediterranean. 
We've also implemented specialized lines for our local partner banks to help their SME clients digitalize, most recently in Morocco and Turkey. We are excited to welcome you to the EBRD's first dedicated digital day as a part of this year annual meet. Our day-long program examines the latest trends pertinent to our clients and countries of operations. It also testifies to the importance of digital as a strategic priority for the EBRD. What a great video. Let's dive in. Are we ready? <laughs> now, please join me in welcoming Francis Malige, Managing Director of Financial Institutions at EBRD, for opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Sina, and uh, so I won't repeat the video, obviously. Uh, <laughs> you all already have heard that I'm French. Nobody's perfect. Uh, but uh, a very warm Barry Louis, Yef Barry Galoust, welcome for the non-Armenian speakers, good morning to the first ever FinTech Digital Day of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. We've had 33, uh, 33 annual meetings, believe it or not, and 32 of those have been without a digital FinTech Day. So it's high time that we repair that mistake, and that's what, together with Yatsek, who's our uh, leader of the digital transformation effort at TBRD, we decided to, to have this event together, together today. So, but before we launch into the discussion, and I'm very excited with all of the panelists and uh, fireside participants that we're going to have today, I want to extend a special thanks uh, to, and a special acknowledgement to this building, to this institution, the TUMO Center in Yerevan. It's one of a few TUMO centers in the world which welcome young students. That's why we need to leave the place by 4 p.m. when the students will come in. Because let me tell you, this is going to look very, very different once the kids are in there. Uh, and it's a pleasure to see young uh, you know, teenagers come and build robots and uh, program uh, in, this, in this center when, when you come visit. So as we convene today, it's clear that the winds of change are blowing strong across the financial sector and across the entire economy. Fueled by the march of technology, digitalization has become a cornerstone of progress, reshaping industries, societies, economies. It's very, very dear to our, to our heart as EBRD, also because we specialize in some large but many small countries. And when you are in a small country and the market opportunity is therefore a little bit smaller, it's easy to pass them over. That's exactly what we want to avoid. We want the best of technology, the best of digitalization in every single of the 36 countries of operations and in every society of our region. And where to start? The financial sector is a great place where to start because it drives a lot of aspects of society. If you don't have proper digital banking services, a lot of other things go slower in the, in the economy. And one thing that we try to do today is that we try to bring fintechs and banks and suppliers of technology together. Because one lesson I draw from the past 10 years is that the opposition between fintechs and banks, remember the nimble fintechs were going to drive banks into the ground, these dinosaurs were not going to survive. That's largely passé now. The banks have become a little bit more nimble than they used to be, perhaps. But also, there's, co there's cooperation as well as competition between the fintechs and the banks, and that is all for the better, and for the better of the, of the consumers and of the, especially the small companies in, in our region. We gave you some examples of the work we do in the video. I'm not going to repeat them, but I just want to leave you with the notion that today demonstrates further our commitment to fostering innovation and collaboration in the financial and in the fintech ecosystem to create this platform, to bring you all together, to have the ability to exchange ideas to converge, partnerships to form, and I'll be only happier if, say, in six months' time or next year, someone comes to me and says, hey, we, we did that great deal together with that firm that we met at the EBRD Digital Day. So take the opportunity, meet interesting bankers, interesting microfinance institutions, people that want to bring their societies forward, 
and together to invest in changing lives, as is the motto of EBRD. Thank you very, very much, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Christina. I love the collaboration aspect. And now I would like to invite Sunil Sabharwal, a financial services and fintech executive and founder of Payments International, to join me for a chat. Thank Hi, you. thank you. Sunil, before we dive in, give me a background of your uh, cybersecurity and fintech upbringing. So before we dive <laughs> into that, actually, let me uh, thank the EBRD and the sponsors for uh, inviting me back to this 33rd annual meeting. I think I'm the only person in the room who was there at the very first EBRD annual meeting in, uh, in Budapest, Hungary, having opened that office <laughs> just a couple of months uh, uh, before that. So now people are going to conclude, uh, what is this old guy sitting here, and what's he going to tell us about technology? Well, they're in for a, for, for a, for a surprise. So um, I actually went on from the EBRD, sp having spent 20 years in fintech and all that, so happy to delve into that. So what are the potential opportunities and challenges in the realm of fintech for sectors like mobile wallets and embedded finance? Sure. So. Um, uh, after the EBRD, I spent some time at the IMF, so we've learned that we define everything first at the IMF, and you talk about uh, financial inclusion. Now, um, the traditional um, notion when you said financial inclusion, what did people think? People thought, well, it's what percentage of the population has a bank account? And, and let me give an example of a, of a country that's not a country of operations, so I'm not going to show bias. Let's say Indonesia, the fourth uh, largest, most populous country in the world, 270 million people, if you ask them on a traditional basis, financial inclusion, the answer will be it's 40%. But now, if you ask them, how about people that have access to some kind of financial services through uh, mobile wallets, that number is 80%. So that, uh, so that magnitude is enormous. That's 100 million extra people. And what I want to bring people's attention to is that uh, when we talk about um, access to financial services, uh, we really have to think of two different categories. There's the, the SWIFT world, the bank world, and there's, there's several billion, perhaps eight billion bank accounts in the, in the world, but there's also about eight billion mobile wallets in the world. When I say mobile wallets, they are, they are established by mobile network operators, major e-commerce uh, and social media, platforms, and this ladder is, of course, growing much faster. Um, through the SWIFT system, when you're sending money to, into a, a bank account, that's cumbersome, costly, but kind of gets there. The challenge and the opportunity is actually to create con connectivity to these mobile wallets. So each country will have three, four, five mobile wallets, but, but you have to build a connection to them. So there's, of course, some large companies for that, uh, big, big, big players such as D-Local and Noom and, of course, PayPal uh, started that. But each and every one of them is unable to get to the 100, uh, close to 200 countries in the world uh, with the four, five, six mobile wallets. So that's where the local and regional players come in. If you build that connectivity, you will have a partner, a potential acquirer uh, for that. So I highlight that as a, as a large opportunity uh, for fintech providers in the region. Technology is really making it possible to have finance without borders. Absolutely. So um, if you let, we can, we can actually um, um, shift into a little bit, to, let's shift into cross-border uh, uh, payments. Uh, folks uh, don't realize, but, but, but cross-border payments is enormous. So if you think of global GDP, Round number is about 100 trillion. Cross-border payments, the value of cross-border businesses governs about 300 trillion. Because, of course, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of cross-border payments. The, the, the amount of money generated by this is about $250 billion. It's an enormous revenue pool for businesses. Now, if we go down a step below uh, remittances, 
Um, remittances defined as uh, uh, people to people uh, cross border payments. That's about officially, the, the World Bank uh, puts it at about 800 billion. Unofficially, the gray and black market is a double, so let's say close to, 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 to trillion. And there, um, uh, you have, let's take the largest remittances company, Western Union. It was 150 years ago, still is uh, today. But even Western Union is unable to make a payment let's say, um, from uh, Poland to a Tanzanian mobile wallet. Again, the, the local opportunity comes in for the provider to enable that last mile uh, payment. Going off of your point, cross-border payments are rapidly expanding, and it is a force for good. But with that comes a new added layer, a new challenge of fraud security and fraud protection. Can you dive into that and how countries can really stay ahead and be prepared for, for, for fraud protection? Yes, so, um, so one of the challenges uh, with cross-border payments is that each bank and each a regulator has its own set of rules. So in a SWIFT transaction that potentially goes through four banks, there'll be a compliance check four times with slightly different rules. So in every time there's even a little uh, complication it gets thrown back. So it's very inefficient. So, uh, so, so, um, so coordinating that compliance uh, structure becomes critical. And let me, let me throw a, a, a phrase at, this, uh, to, at you and at this audience, which is frammel. So we used to talk about fraud and anti-money laundering, but the, the, really the next gen and the new gen of, of providers, uh, you know, we call it frammel, fraud, uh, anti-money laundering, because what's happening is that when we say fraud, it's people um, steal someone's uh, identity, so that's fraud, but then they use that that stolen identity to make illicit payment, so that's AML, and they are sitting in the banks and in the financial institutions in two different departments. So even in the same institution, they are separate, so the, the effort of looking at it is duplicated. Now put that across three, four institutions, and you get an idea of what the problem is. One really good example for this is, of course, um, you know, Singapore is always a very good example when you, when you come to fintech. And, and Singapore, kind of at the regulator, central bank level, started an, what they call an anti-financial crime ecosystem where um, they're getting all the fraud data in from all the, the banks, the fintechs, the regulator, the law firms, because everybody is doing this check, but there's no coordination of them. So uh, you get rid of... Um, information that identifies private information, so, so privacy is protected, but you're able to detect new patterns of fraud coming from bank A or law firm B, and that you can share across the entire ecosystem. So Singapore has put in place, and I, I would recommend certainly that uh, the EBRD's countries of operations uh, who have an issue with, with fraud and AML really take a look at that example. That's incredible, something that all countries can use, the framework uh, uh, that all countries can absolutely. use. Absolutely. So yes. Neil, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your thought leadership and your insight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. I would now like to invite our FinTech panelists to join me on stage. Nikoros Kurdiani, CEO of Groups Operations in Uzbekistan. Vahe Andonians, Founder, Chief Technology Officer, and Chief Product Officer at Cognase. David Bolat, Director of Financial Services at Faculty. And Yara El Abd, Senior Director of Investments at Value. This panel is titled Evolving Finance, Catching the Next Wave of FinTech Innovation. From fit payment services to B2B to B2B to X solutions, fintech innovations are not only revolutionizing financial services, but they're also presenting new opportunities and addressing unmet market needs. So our panelists will dive into the latest trends, risks, and opportunities into the space, and we're looking forward to hearing. Thank you for joining. Let's start broad. What are some of the digital technologies that are affecting the financial sector? No. Yep. Okay. Now everybody can hear me. 
uh, the dangers of going first. Um, so you might not be uh, surprised when I tell you that I think it's uh, probably artificial intelligence which is driving a lot of transformation, uh, both in financial institutions and uh, kind of among fintechs. Um, and I think there are kind of a raft of opportunities here uh, that you're kind of seeing with artificial intelligence. Um, the way I kind of think about this is in kind of very principled terms in terms of uh, the profit and loss statement. And where I think you're going to see the biggest impact from uh, artificial intelligence is going to be around um, reducing the operating costs uh, for financial institutions, whether that is in terms of driving down marketing costs, whether that's in, uh, in terms of streamlining the production of in internal documentation. All of these kinds of uh, opportunities are now uh, kind of presenting themselves with AI. That's a great segue to Vahe. As AI continues to evolve, what are the implications for job roles and the skills required within the fintech industry? Um, we start with the most difficult question, right? <laughs> so it's uh, actually very hard to predict, I think. Um, uh, I, I think one thing that is going to be more and more important is the range, like not anymore a specialization into one thing, because in all honesty, AI is already, and if not, will very soon be the best in any specialization, be it the software engineering, be it the hardware engineering, and so on. So the question is more about how can you connect these things and then uh, pr you know, produce something useful for the society. So I think a range is, uh, is one of the most important things. And if you look at the current stack of AI and if you look at the companies right now that are innovating, it's, it's always a mixture between um, engineers, because it's a, it's a big engineering practice, and then science, so you also have to have a, a foundation in scientific processes, um, but also a lot in um, you know, data engineering and understanding of that industry that you're operating. So it's right now these three things together form it, but even that will change, and I think you will even need more range to, to be useful uh, with, with AI. That's a great point. Nikos, um, in Uzbekistan, are you seeing the use of AI or how is um, emerging technology really playing a role in the country's operations? Yeah, thank you for inviting and good to be here. So absolutely, yes. There are several trends, basically. There are companies uh, which provide serv AI services, box solutions, which mostly target cost reduction, uh, process optimization. And the use cases are several, right? Soft collection, uh, inbound call center, a bit of sales, all the process automation and all this kind of stuff. However, there are also some cases where basically AI is deployed into the customer service. And I think personally that this is the biggest uh, impact of AI we're gonna see in financial services and other industries. If we look at the, at the last 10 years, everything was about mobile bank and mobile interface and the form factor of a mobile. Whereas we lost the, the, the relationship management, right? The concepts to an extent, the customer is directly interfacing a mobile. Here I think the AI will come in and to an extent revive the concept of relationship management and consulting through, 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 through a third party, you know, an instrument which is, which is giving you an advice. So we personally, I mean in our company, this is where we are going to basically. We are now working on Uzbek language, Uzbek Tajik, because there are lots of dialects in Uzbekistan. So basically a mixture of languages, robot that will be serving customers. And this will be becoming our new form factor, so to say, very soon. Robots are the new norm. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see the regulatory environment evolving as these technologies are evolving in Uzbekistan? Yeah, I think, uh, firstly, in Uzbekistan, what we see is that the regulator is, is very uh, open to, to, to many new things happening because the country as a whole is restructuring and reforming itself. So the, 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 the curiosity level on all, all aspects is very high. So we think that this will come also and, and there will be no issues. But overall, there, there are lots of topics around the AI in terms of security, data privacy, you know, all this kind of stuff that people have to think about and I'm sure regulators will follow up. It's a great segue into Yara. Yara, you're the Senior Director of Investments at Value and you oversee um, the overall investment strategies. What are you seeing in um, the rise in startups in developing countries and how is cross-border expansion in fintech playing into that? Um, we're seeing obviously a lot more happening. It's a very exciting time to be in an emerging market in the startup ecosystem. I think um, because necessity is the mother of invention, you have a lot of these 
different challenges in emerging economies that we know traditional banks and the traditional financial system are not as adequately able to solve and you have a lot of startups fitting into that gap and fulfilling that role. And when it comes to maybe cross-border expansion, when it comes to fintech in particular, I think it's a very um, unique experience. You have a very, very heavily regulated system worldwide. Every country comes with its own set of regulations, compliance requirements, liquidity standards, KYC, AML, a whole list of it. So it's not like importing or exporting a product. It's trying to be very flexible and adaptive to really pinpointing what is the solution that I'm trying to solve in this market. Okay, it exists. What tools do I have that I'm good at using? Can I utilize them? Okay, I need to be flexible in how I'm going to offer this product because it might look completely different from one country or one market to the next when essentially it is the same problem you're trying to solve using the same tools. Um, I think this also brings a lot more opportunity for collaboration between cross-border startups. Um, I think <coughs> a, a previous colleague already mentioned this, how that last mile, how other um, fintechs in those different markets you can partner with in order for them to sort of smooth the way for your own operations. In what ways can startups and established financial institutions collaborate in order to propel this forward? Well, I think um, you have to first understand what's the scope of collaboration, right? Because um, if your scope of collaboration is adjacent innovation, then you're dealing with very different institutions than if it is radical innovation, right? A JP Morgan, a Moody's, a Fitch, they don't need adjacent innovation. They are masters of that, right? So if you're dealing with them, you need to actually be a company that is offering radical innovation. And if you're doing that, then, of course, um, a collaboration can be much more on the back end of it. So an institution doesn't want to risk their reputation, their, um, their you know, trust that they have gained over hundreds of years with, with very you know, uh, radical ideas, but they can be a backbone of it. Right? So you can deal with them at the backbone and you are at the front of it. Whereas if you are much more an adjacent innovator, then it is much more about embedding into a financial institution, right? like an institution as a service, and then you offer a piece of that through that if it is an adjacent thing, right? But it's very important to understand what kind of innovation you're offering. Going off of that, David, are there ways where startups can learn from these established financial institutions and implement their practices? Yeah, I think so. Um, but I think Francis said it right, uh, right at the beginning, which is this is about cooperation uh, along, you know, to use sort of your uh, example, axes where there are natural complementarities. So I think over the medium to long term, institutions just like individuals can evolve and change, but in the short term, actually you are who you are. So uh, it's very difficult to change. And right now we're at an inflection moment where financial institutions, whether you're a startup or whether you're an established incumbent, need to change. And so in the short term, actually, I think it's, too, it's almost too difficult for a company to change their DNA. And so rather than trying to mimic, let's say the entrepreneurialism uh, the use of technology that a lot of fintechs have in their DNA, the best way in which kind of large uh, financial institutions can actually acquire those skills, expertise is through uh, collaboration. I love that. The established institutions can really adapt and collect that agility and transformational and innovation side from the startups and in turn the startups can uh, learn from the established exactly. institutions in order to grow. Vahem, most of your team is in Armenia. Your developers and your tech team is in Armenia. What growth opportunities does it present for countries like Armenia and other developing countries? I, mean, I think the opportunity is huge, of course, right? Um, because um, uh, AI is not new to fintech or banking, AI is new to everybody, every industry and everything, right? So we are in the midst of an industrial revolution. It doesn't matter if you count it the second, third or fourth, we are at the beginning of one. So everything is going to change and, um, and it's a great opportunity for countries to catch up. Uh, it also has a lot of risk, of course, because I mean, besides education, which is the, uh, the, the, the no-brainer, you also have to think about uh, digital infrastructure. And digital infrastructure is not just internet connection, it is also compute these days, and there's also lots of data. So can you offer that, and how can you offer that, and what is your regulation around this? So there's a lot of topics that you need to cover to actually build a, a thriving, uh, thriving um, you know, microstructure of, of innovation. 
Going back to the regulatory landscape, Nico Ross, are there any challenges that you see? Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the challenges are, again, the, the openness, predictability, and curiosity on the regulatory side, because basically the innovation happens, and this is everywhere, and especially in financial services, if the regulator is not catching up with the tempo of the innovation, then, then things may get stuck, and we have seen it in many ways. For instance, digital onboarding practices were first to come for private individual segment, where uh, SMEs followed after many years, and in many countries, these things are still not settled. So, in my opinion, the biggest challenge is the regulator also to think innovatively in terms of catching up with the industry and making sure that they regulate uh, accordingly because uh, not regulating at all it means stopping things from happening. And in my opinion, the levels of curiosity on the regulatory side is the key. Things as a muscle for the regulators to develop. That's a great segue to David. How will central bank digital currencies impact traditional banks? Oh. Well, uh, as an ex-central banker, um, I have lots of different views on this. I think, in theory, uh, CBDC could be quite transformative, but I think in practice it, it won't be. Um, and it could be transformative because, uh, in theory, the central bank would be creating a truly risk-free asset. And therefore, uh, particularly for, de for depositors who want ultra safety, they might uh, leave their current banking providers and actually move their accounts to the central bank. I think in practice, uh, the CBDC is not going to be so transformative because central banks are quite worried about potential disintermediation. And so there are all sorts of uh, rules being put in place around not remunerating those deposits and putting a cap on the absolute uh, balance of those deposits, which means that it will be a relatively unattractive proposition. So I think actually the real risk that central banks run is that um, we won't have disintermediation, but their CBDC will actually go down, as the Brits like to say, as a damp squib, uh, as basically a dud. And so central banks will have invested a lot of resource and possibly their reputations into launching this product, and it just simply won't, uh, it won't be taken up. And we see this, for example, uh, in Nigeria, where they've la launched the e-Nira, and it just hasn't, um, hasn't taken, taken off. And fintech partnerships are also becoming increasingly more common. So what are some of the key factors to consider? We're here, we're all here to network, to collaborate. Um, what can we take away from that? Yeah, I think, I think I'll, I'll go for it. So I think, you know, there is one trend which is very visible. If fintech 10 years ago was something, and I think Francis was mentioning it in the introduction. So if if it was something for a separate industry and the banking industry was separate, now, now what we see is, is, is all banks understand that technology is the way of working. And, uh, and that's why, in my opinion, the, the term fintech slowly it converges into one something common for financial services industry as a whole. So in, in this regard, you know, collaboration to an extent uh, uh, is a word uh, which, 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 in my opinion, would not really uh, be very actual in several years. For instance, uh, basically, uh, all, all banks are, are, are thinking that certain technology services within the financial service industry are core businesses. So when it's a core business, you don't tend to outsource it or collaborate with somebody. You tend to create it within yourself. So in my opinion, the name of the game for the next 10 years is that the, the banks will become fintechs. And, and this is the key, key strategy point. Otherwise, you know, the services will, will become obsolete. And, and this is something that all banks should think about. Absolutely. Yara, how can um, emerging markets be supported in order to foster this thriving ecosystem that Nicole has just mentioned? I think um, emerging markets have an important role themselves to play, actually, as well, in fostering this type of innovation. Um, they can, the challenges and opportunities are like two sides of the same coin. So whereas they don't have, they're not sort of dragged down by legacy traditional financial systems, um, they have the opportunity. I think sometimes it's easier, instead of trying to adapt or change a system to fit a new purpose, they have the luxury of designing these new systems and this infrastructure with that purpose in mind. And if we've learned anything, I think that the initial purpose that we had these systems and this infrastructure built for, people kind of thought they knew where things were going. And I think what we've sort of realized is that what we need to build it for more than anything is being adaptive and flexible because 
as we were saying, AI and all the other types of technologies are taking the sector somewhere where I'm not sure anyone can exactly imagine. So um, the other thing that emerging markets have the luxury of doing is leapfrogging other technologies, learning lessons from other markets that have already established these things. And truly, like, um, being able to leverage technology, I think, in emerging markets, it's not just a luxury or an imperative. It is an imperative. So whereas in a more developed market, technology can improve or enhance service delivery, in emerging markets, sometimes you cannot deliver the service without technology. And we've seen how the scaling of fintech in emerging markets has completely outpaced um, more developed economies. And in that sense, I think, so the sharing of lessons learned from more advanced economies, learning their mistakes, learning what not to do, being able to set and build infrastructure and systems in place with the proper purpose set in mind uh, would be the main two. So that's a great point and great segue into David. How can financial institutions in emerging markets keep up with the pace of gen AI in order to be successful? Yeah, you know, in a, in a strange way, I think this gen AI moment is actually going to level the playing field. Um, both between kind of mature uh, banks and uh, fintechs and also banks that are operating um, in uh, mature economies and uh, emerging markets. In the following way, I think what we've seen is that actually uh, Silicon Valley firms uh, and big tech firms generally have an absolute advantage in the production of uh, large language models and foundation models which are the basis for apps like ChatGPT. And actually, I think no bank will actually be able to mimic these capabilities. So all banks are strangely now in this boat, as you were sort of uh, alluding. Um, and so in that sense, it's actually a very democratizing moment. Um, and so uh, I, I think that that's, uh, you know, we're entering this kind of new phase where uh, all banks, you know, can access these large language models through an API and then kind of train them with their own in internal data. I think all of all banks, whether you're in an emerging market or whether you're in a uh, mature uh, capital market, will be looking to partner with um, third parties, whether those are third party vendors uh, selling products like various co-pilots or looking at kind of third party uh, specialist consultancies that have that expertise to create uh, proprietary um, kind of models. So I think it's, a, it's actually a, a, an exciting moment uh, wherever you are. And shifting gears over to the startup space, Vahe, how can fintech startups accelerate innovation in AI while also keeping up with all the regulatory changes? Yeah, I mean, um, a few things that I would like to add here. So I think, yes, you're right, it's democratizing, but it's only democratizing because of a meta out there which is actually really making it open source because otherwise uh, you have four companies that are providing large language models and then they are not providing it to certain countries, right? So you're already out of that. And it's only through Meta that you actually have access to this uh, and, and you're democratizing it. Um, and uh, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to fintechs, I think um, he's very right. I think this, uh, word fintech is weird because everything should be tech, right? I mean, uh, even a hotel should be mostly tech, right? So, um, but I think the most important uh, factor here is enough resources in compute and data. These are the two things that right now are the decisive factors to be successful. And of course, uh, both are difficult uh, to get. Um, so in one sense, I think that a regulation can help because um, in all honesty, in countries that have um, lower regulatory burdens, uh, obviously will be favored by some institutions to settle there. So this regulatory arbitrage is definitely happening. It's even happening within the European Union. Uh, so uh, banks are moving their places to places where they can actually have more access to data. And then uh, compute is the next thing, right? So if you have these two things, then I think you can be successful. Do you see a difference in opportunity for landlocked or remote countries? Yeah, of course. I mean, it offers uh, any kind of, and here we have to be, I think, a little bit uh, uh, more precise, any, any kind of dematerialization helps landlocked countries. Digitalization is 
most of the time dematerializations, but not always, right? A smartphone is a good example. If you're moving uh, credit cards to an e-wallet, that's actually not a dematerialization because you still need access to that phone, right? You need access to something. Whereas in a, in a real dematerialization, you don't need access to anything and then just internet basically, and that is of course really, really helping landlocked countries, right? Switching gears a little bit. Um, Yara, tell me, what is the role of women in fintech? Oh. So unfortunately, women are rather underrepresented in fintech at the moment. Um, you have finance, which is predominantly a male-dominated sector, and technology the same. When you marry the two, you have the ultimate boys club, I guess. Um, the situation is getting a lot better. Around 10 years ago, I think females represented around 6% of fintech founders. Um, last year, it was closer to 15, it's still a very, very long way to go. We still have women very underrepresented in the fintech workforce. I think it's less than 30% now, um, which is a huge shame. I mean, you're leaving a lot of returns on the table, not just by having women, but by having that type of diversity. So um, diverse teams do uh, materialize better returns. It's not just having an all-female founding team or an all-male founding team. It's, that diversity, that synergy that really creates the type of returns that we're all looking to gain. Um, they face higher barriers. I think it's more of a perception issue, which might be a bit more challenging to solve than an actual maybe regulatory or legal issue, which could just be changed. But when it's a perceptional issue, it takes maybe a little bit longer. And um, the perception that it is a male-dominated industry just keeps fueling that uh, lack of representation, I feel. Um, women have a harder time accessing finance. They receive smaller tickets at lower valuations than their male counterparts. Um, they, ask, they get asked different questions by investors. I mean, men get asked more about growth potential, but women get asked more about risk prevention, you know? Um, there was this one study a few years ago, I'm not sure who it was by, I think it was the Harvard Business School, where they had men and women make the exact same pitch to a group of investors, and the male pitches got rated much more highly than the women. So again, it's just this perception issue, but the more um, females we have, the more it also fuels the perception in the other direction. Um, so it's an exponential improvement, I think. Um, we have more women writing checks now, which also makes it a lot easier, women on VCs, in VC, sorry, and in investment firms. Um, so I'm very optimistic that women are going to be playing, you know, their, the role that they're supposed to be playing in the ecosystem with, you know, spillover effects for the entire ecosystem. Do you see a difference of the role of women in emerging markets versus more developed countries? So I think it's what you might not expect, but that women are represented, are more represented in emerging economies than in um, more advanced economies. I believe the MENA region where I'm from uh, women represent around 30% of fintech, uh, fintech founders, which is great. Um, so I think maybe because the gender bias in that sense is a little bit lower, our governments are doing a little bit more to improve uh, female representation in STEM studies. Um, we have a lot more effort from uh, like development partners and from governments to establish more networks, which is very important. Um, informal and formal networks where women can access um, mentorship opportunities, they can uh, improve like soft skills that make it harder for them to uh, excel in the environment. In emerging markets, fintech also has the potential to significantly improve uh, financial inclusion. What strategies need to be implemented in developing countries in order to really democratize finance, that theme that keeps coming up? Nikos? Yeah. I think, I think firstly, uh, digital technologies in every service, as Rachel was saying, even ho hotels, for instance, right? I mean, uh, they, they, uh, they are borderless, they are regionless. I mean, we have in Uzbekistan penetration, we have now f uh, approximately 15 million registered users in Uzbekistan, and we operate in the country only four years, uh, a bit more than four years. So how is possible to get so many customers, which is like 45% of the population, in four years, right? I mean, this is through digital. So. And, and we are represented in the regions as well, not only in Tashkent, because Tashkent altogether with its region is like four million. So in this regard, you know, digital technologies overall allow access to services. Would it be financial services, would it be educational services, or any other services? So in my opinion, 
on, on regulatory level or on policy making level, overall, these things should be promoted because internet, as Rahe was saying, I mean, this allows, you know, seamless penetration, would it be landlocked countries or remote regions? So this is something to think about and this is something to realize because in my opinion, many countries, industries still do not realize that. I mean, take branch-based banking, it still exists. I mean, you may have branches for whatever reason. We do not have one single branch in Uzbekistan. You may have branches for whatever reason, but you are limited in terms of scaling to the branch footprint. So you need to have digital footprint to, to break these borders. So all these things should be thought through, and then the question is answered by itself. You really have a unique perspective on implementing financial technologies in local and global regions. Are there any specific challenges that you've encountered with implementing these technologies in Uzbekistan versus other areas around the world? I think overall, you know, if we see the level of acceleration of technology adoption, um, the infrastructure becomes an issue. And the third party services that you need in any case to implement this kind of services become an issue because not everything digitalizes on the same pace or on the same level. For instance, if you take Uzbekistan case, I mean, uh, suddenly the country, four or five years ago, there were not many banks who had uh, mobile banking apps. Now there is not a single financial services player and, and other players who do not offer services through mobile banking. And this all is interconnected. So the pressure on infrastructure and the pressure on the stability of services increased massively and this is something that becomes visibly a hassle and we have to solve it because otherwise, I mean, there will be always certain timeouts, you know, breakdowns, uh, and all these kind of service quality issues. And in my opinion, this is the biggest challenge what we see at this point, but this is also developing, you know, it is catching up. David, what are some specific um, factors and uh, specific details that fintechs can actually incorporate in their daily practices in order to keep up with the ongoing changes? Fintechs. Um, yeah, so I, you know, a lot of the discussion so far has been, in a sense, one-sided about how large financial institutions either can uh, partner with um, uh, 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 fintechs or they can kind of adopt their business models. But I think your question is actually pointing to, to something quite interesting, which is one thing with you know, the exception of a few fintechs that we haven't seen is those fintechs really scale up. And so those traditional financial institutions are really expert at knowing how to get economies of scale, increasing returns to scale from business processes and all of the, the trappings that go around kind of the actual uh, digital offer. So I think that there are, are lessons to be learned in the way in which uh, larger organizations uh, run their operations at scale that can be incorporated by fintechs that are looking to move, let's say, from startup uh, to, to scale up. Um, and actually, one of the, uh, the interesting uh, cases in, in the United Kingdom, I won't mention them by name, but one of the sort of the well-known fintechs, uh, they've yet to sort of get a banking license. And one of the reasons uh, has been because of perceptions that they don't yet have the right skills to navigate uh, the regulatory envir environment and have the right kind of compliance skills in-house. So what has often been seen actually as a cost center within banks, your compliance functions, your legal functions, your regulatory functions, actually is a source of competitive advantage uh, for them increasingly. And so I think that's a lesson for, for, for fintechs to actually think really critically about how they kind of professionalize their risk management. Uh, practices. That's a great point. And we also discussed the cross-border collaboration of the fintech industry, but the fintech industry affects every other sector. So what is, can you expand on the cross-sector collaboration that fintechs can really impact? Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, one of the great things about working uh, at, at faculty, uh, which is the, the company that I work for, is that we work kind of at this intersection, uh, not only with fintechs and sort of established players, but also with um, academic partners. So we quality assure uh, some of the frontier models that are coming out of the world's leading research labs and universities, and yet also are kind of playing a role in the productionization uh, of AI. We were um, OpenAI, the company that's behind ChatGPT's first uh, integration, te technical integration partner. Um, and so uh, I think we sort of see ourselves, and we of course have um, peers that are actually out there trying to broker these connections, because as you sort of allude to, there are um, lessons to be learned uh, you know, across different sectors in terms of the, the dynamism that sort of fintechs have been able to evince and, uh, and can be applied elsewhere. 
And I have a final question before we uh, go into the Q&A session for all panelists. What does the future, uh, what future trends do you anticipate um, with the intersection of AI and FinTech and how can companies be prepared to really address these shifts? Yara, we'll start with you. I see that there is massive potential in this intersection to really expand financial inclusion beyond anything we've seen. I think um, globally we've done a great job in accelerating this shift, but I think the next period we're going to see something completely different. Using machine learning algorithms to underwrite your clients allows you to um, give access to hundreds of millions of people who traditional um, banks either ignore or overlook completely. So I think that's the major thing that we're going to see in the future, how AI is really going to be able to help us push towards a more inclusive uh, society. Yeah, I think uh, the, the, the kind of the, the future trends and, and opportunities here really depend on where you're kind of situated um, in financial services. So whether you're a, a bank or whether you're an insurer. But if I kind of just um, select out two aspects here where I sort of think um, we're, we're going to see sort of trends and the application of, of AI um, specifically. Uh, in retail banking, as I alluded to right at the, at the top, I think we're going to see a massive drive to the reduction of operational costs uh, to the point that was mentioned earlier, kind of a move from uh, brick and mortar and branch-based banking to, to digital all underpinned uh, by artificial intelligence. Uh, and actually there, I think that that move is less about gaining a competitive advantage as much as, uh, or actually more, it's that it's just the cost for doing business. You have to make this transition. Um, but if I look at something like asset management or investment banking, there I see sort of opportunities for competitive differentiation uh, through the application of artificial intelligence. Actually, uh, with funds that you wouldn't necessarily expect. So you might think that I, I have in mind here kind of systematic investment funds, but I actually have more in mind fundamental investors because now all of this uh, new Gen AI large language models will allow for the interrogation of those really thick SEC filings or those really you know, thick uh, amounts of uh, paper, both sort of digital and hard copy that are, exist out there on firms. So that ability to unlock additional analytical insight on individual companies, I think, uh, if done right, using uh, generative AI and artificial intelligence will give uh, asset managers, will give particularly those who are fundamental investors a, a competitive edge. And so I think that's where you'll sort of see the industry going there. Amazing. Yeah, I think uh, you're touching on something very interesting with this cost because I'm, um, I would like to challenge you a little bit because um, what I think is what you really do if you move everything away and you don't have these uh, branches anymore, you're also losing your attachment to your client. Like if you just go back 30 years ago, you would walk into a bank, the bank clerk would know you, would know your family, would know exactly your situation that you are in and could offer you the best advice. And we lost all of that because now if you go to Deutsche Bank, they don't know me. I'm a number for them. They know nothing about me. And I think AI can help here because AI can be the bridge of these two worlds. Because rather than looking at it as a cost saving, you can look at it, it can give you much deeper insights of these people. So instead of a person being there and interacting with it, I can collect so much data about these people and then have a digital twin kind of model that predicts, oh, this is what Baha actually needs. And I can offer him and serve him the best thing. So I think that actually AI is necessary for doing this transition, and not, not just to reduce cost, but actually to deliver the, the insight. And I think another place where AI really can help a lot is this interoperability that uh, uh, the colleague was talking before, because you know when we talk about the last mile, the difficulty there is that um, uh, there are different protocols, different languages, different you know, APIs, and so on. It's very hard to integrate with everything. But I, I, I very much believe that um, maybe even this year, maybe even with the announcement that we had two days ago with Anthropic, that we will achieve a semantic interpreter and the next programming language is going to be English. So basically, if you want to interoperate, you just write it down and that's it. There's no API calls, there's nothing anymore because AI will always translate it to the exact same thing uh, which an interpreter does. And I think these two things can, can, you know, can really change, uh, change uh, the industry as a whole. Yeah. I think uh, it was a great introduction to what I was going to say. 
because, uh, because I think really that uh, we have lots of data about customers, we know the customers, but there is no human touch in the relationship in the fintech world because it's just the only form factor which is digital interface. Would it be mobile mostly or internet? And in my opinion, the next thing to come is, is having a relationship management component put into this digital interface. So the trend which was called do-it-yourself trend basically will revert a bit and it will be do-it-yourself with the help of AI. And, uh, and, and I think this is very big. This is in reality huge because to me it, it changes the form factor altogether because there, maybe there is no need for mobile interface anymore. That we can just talk. And there are many experiments now going on. And this is one. And second is overall I agree. I mean, I wouldn't look at it as a cost reduction because, because AI is very costly and it will be very costly for the company. So I would say it's just you know, putting the cost accent on a different shelf in your company, developing AI, but with this in massively increasing productivity, right? And what Vahe was just saying as an example is again a productivity increasing instrument, one of the purposes. So in my opinion, first is changing the form factor, the way we deliver services, and not only in FinTech, in many other industries as well. Medicine, if you think about medicine, you can just explode, right? I mean, there are so many opportunities education and so on. And second is massive improvement of productivity. In my opinion, we will become just much more productive. That brings a great point and one more question before we move on to the audience questions. Um, given the rise in AI, how can we ensure that AI is acting as a tool rather than a replacement? Because there's all this buzz of how AI is actually going to just come and replace the workforce. How do we ensure that it acts as a supplement? Do we have to ensure that? Or a compliment, sorry, not a do supplement. We, do, we, do, we, do we really have to ensure that? <laughs> I, think, I think, you know, when Facebook was created back in the day, I mean, nobody was thinking how we should ensure that we will not lose physical interaction with people. So it's like, in, in my opinion, this is imaginary risks that we are now talking about and spending so much energy. In reality, we should just exploit it, you know, and see what is going on afterwards. So I would go... For, for massive use of it and then adjusting as we go, rather than thinking about the risks up front. Well, I mean, I think uh, um, what my colleague is saying is the, the so-called Obama doctrine. Uh, if enough good people use it, it will be a good thing. Uh, let's, let's hope that is right. Um, I think it's, it's very difficult to predict. I think every generation thinks that the generation that we are in is, uh, is hard to predict the future. But in, in all seriousness, I think this is the first and only generation where we absolutely have no idea how the world will look in 20 years. We really don't, as we had no idea what ChatGPT can do even six months after it was released, right? Uh, we have to realize that. It took us six months to realize what these language models actually can do in context learning. Right? So, so we, we, that we are living in a very uncertain world and uh, it's very, very hard to predict. I think that... Um, our um, uh, advantage in abstract thinking and also abstract uh, joy and abstract pain will ultimately lead to that we can design a world where we can, uh, we can control AI the way we need to control it. I think to your point though, um, these concerns echo throughout the ages. So you know, when Adam Smith was kind of observing the amazing productivity of the pin factory, um, he also was worried about kind of the de-skilling of of workers, and you kind of hear reverberations of that in today's debate about, about AI, if all of a sudden AI can produce better creative content than uh, creatives can, um, what happens to actually human beings? And so there is always that tension, I think, since uh, kind of the birth of modern economic growth between uh, productivity and then what's going to happen uh, to labor and to citizens in terms of, uh, of their skills and their place in the world. What we have seen, though, over the last 200 odd years is that those concerns actually have been uh, misplaced, that there's a kind of a lump of labor fallacy that, you know, there's only so much work to be done, and once we're actually able to automate that, people will have nothing to do. It's a fallacy. Um, it may very well be the case that financial services doesn't have so much employment as before, and uh, it goes the way of agriculture and actually the proportion of uh, the workforce that's actually employed within FS is much smaller in the future than it was in the past, but those individuals may find uh, new opportunities in uh, sectors yet to be dreamed of. 
I think I agree with what everyone was saying. We're very, as the, hum the human race is very creative and innovative in what we find to do and what sort of new jobs come up. And similar to what you were saying, uh, when we invented machines that took the place of certain type of labor that we did, we thought it was going to be the end of all these jobs, but then we came up with more creative and more jobs that could need more of your mind than your muscle. And then now we have AI, which is also supporting that. So that might open up new spaces that we never even thought that we could do, you know? Do you think there is a first mover advantage when it comes to companies that are incorporating AI early on in their practices? I think there definitely is a first mover advantage, but I think what we're seeing is that more companies are adopting things more fast, so it's harder to leverage that first mover advantage for a longer period of time, um, whether or not you want to. Sometimes the collaboration actually creates a stronger multiplier effects for you. Um, so definitely, yes, there is, but now that we're, there's a lot more um, you know, open APIs and people are sharing a lot more information, we're seeing that they don't, we don't feel the need to leverage that first mover advantage as much as we used to, that collaboration actually is much more useful and effective. Absolutely. David? I think, um, first of all, yes, you want to be a, a first mover if, uh, if possible or a fast follower, uh, but not, not a laggard here. But I would get, again go to the point that the space of AI is moving so rapidly, even in the frontier labs, that actually if you're outside of those labs and a financial institution, it's very hard to, to keep pace. Um, and the real risk, I think, is that you try to build your own internal capabilities and you prematurely optimize. We actually see that over the last 10 years. So what a lot of financial institutions have uh, done is that they have built up their data science teams. It's been a very costly exercise. Now they're coming in 10 years later and they're looking at the ROI of the last 10 years and looking, are we really set up now actually to deliver the next wave of Gen AI? Maybe not, because some of those skills that those data scientists that they hired to develop models, actually they can't develop those foundation models. And more to the point, very often they don't have the uh, machine learning engineering skill to take those models uh, and put, put them into production. So you see a lot of banks, financial institutions, and organizations generally getting stuck in what I would call a POC or a proof of concept purgatory, and they can't actually productionize. And so I think the way in which you try to, to, to move fast, yet also avoid prematurely optimizing, is make sure that you're working with partners who really have their finger on the pulse of the cutting edge. I actually agree with this. I, I think uh, being the first is actually a disadvantage. I mean, if you look at uh, OpenAI, it's a great company. I love it. But, uh, you know, an investor of OpenAI said something very, very nice. He said, like, it looks like philanthropy because you're investing really billions and there's no way that you can actually ever earn this back as an investor. Right? So you don't want to have a bank operate like that. Mm -hmm. right? So actually, I think it is, you want to be the, the first second one. Like you, you really want to be the second there and, and not the third and not the fourth, but you don't want to be the first one. To ensure that monetary ROI. Exactly. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, being the first or being the second or third is a very tactical thing. So in reality, there's a very good quote by Ayn Rand that the creative men strive to achieve, not to beat others. So it's not about competition or being first or second. You know, it's just about creating things and, and one has to literally think how to make this a better place, you know, a better industry. And, and through this, you will make your brand loved. And through that, you will become most probably, you know, number one. So in my opinion, the, the whole ideology should be about innovation and trying to make things better than you were doing yesterday. And then things will come by themselves, you know. Amazing. Thank you so much for your insights. Now it's time for audience questions. And it's not too late to submit your questions. You can scan the QR code on the screens beside us or join slido.com and enter code 4125824. Let's dive in. What is the role of open banking in digitization, and what are the main regulatory challenges? Are there any examples in the region? Yeah, I, I think uh, not many people know uh, this fact about Uzbekistan, 
but Uzbekistan runs a fully fledged open banking uh, for the last uh, 15, 20 years, like fully fledged. So uh, any card issued by any bank is totally bank agnostic and uh, basically one can take cards from one bank and link to any other bank's mobile app and operate fully, even more so, with, I mean, pull out 12 months of uh, transactional history uh, so you can use even the personal financial manager instruments in other apps on your card, which is in another bank. And this created suddenly a massive uh, fintech scene. Uh, we, we own a company called PayMe, which is an uh, aggregator of cards, basically, uh, because uh, open banking allows these kind of companies to exist. And there are lots of different things. For instance, uh, every supermarket chain in Uzbekistan runs also a payment company because uh, it's open banking, so you can link your card to the supermarket app and then pay through that, and, and many other things. So in my opinion, you know, the concept of open banking is strategically super important, and also to, it, it elevates the competition to another level, which is UX, UI design, customer journey, uh, you know, uh, supremacy, so to say, who is the best in customer experience that wins, and, and not, not in locking the customers into your, your own infrastructure and not letting them out, you know. So, and we see this live example in Uzbekistan, the question was in the region, yes, in Uzbekistan, it's, it's fully fledged open banking. It's holistic end-to-end -end solution yeah, rather and than for just 20 a back-end. Yeah, now, where, where UK, Europe, and other countries are just coming up with it. You know, I mean, it is, it is surprising. Great playbook. David, how can financial institutions find an optimal balance between employment and digitization of financial operations? Uh, say the question again for me. How can financial institutions find an optimal balance between employment and digitalization of financial operations? Um, so I think it's actually, we, we touched on this a little bit earlier in terms of um, kind of striking the right balance between um, having people employed in, in financial services and uh, also kind of uh, moving uh, to a more digital model. And I think where financial institutions have been most successful in doing that has been really thinking carefully about their um, talent strategies and thinking about how individuals, let's say, for example, in call centers that might be particularly impacted by the development of uh, large language model powered chatbots can actually progress in, into different roles. So I think the, the linchpin and the key to success here to ensure that people have meaningful careers, and yet at the same time, the organization is uh, pushing kind of the productivity frontier, is to make sure that you've got um, the right sort of talent strategy and support around people as they go on that uh, journey themselves from uh, the, the job that they had and the, the job of the future that they will hold. And bringing it to the region, Vahe Fintech Armenia has opened a foundation called Association and Company in Armenia, and it's a serious operation. Can you comment on the growth potential of fintech in the region? Um, well, I, I mean, I think that uh, this region has a, a very good chance with the work that has been done in the last uh, couple of years to, to be a very important um, player in this ecosystem, in, in, in this, in this uh, region, and beyond this region. Um, I think there's a lot of talent here, and there is a lot of the things that are necessary here. And uh, most importantly, there are a lot of, I have to say, actually individuals that with their personal sacrifice are adding so much to this, uh, to this um, you know, side. Is it, is it a fast? Is it Tumo? Is it, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, startup mixer by, by SI? It doesn't matter. All these things are adding to an ecosystem that uh, is, I think, really healthy right now. And how can we make regulators curious and less risk averse to boost financial inclusion in times of stricter AML laws and sanctions? <laughs> I think we should talk to them. We should talk to them a lot. Uh, we should challenge them back, uh, ask questions, and, uh, and, and uh, at the end of the day, this will help. I mean, we. Personally, I and then my team, we have several examples when we were granted sandboxes for certain innovations. And this was after many talks, many productive talks. Would it be income estimation models, for instance, in Uzbekistan and, uh, and, and many other things? Because when you are, for instance, if you talk about income estimation, if you want to increase access to finance, you have to estimate income of people. Otherwise, uh, you, you are not able to underwrite. 
and, and many, many examples like this, you know. So in this regard, I think the, the recipe is just open talk and not sitting in your office and uh, just talking about the regulators, how uncreative they are. I mean, just go and talk to them, you know. That's it. So going off that, what measures do you believe are essential to ensure the security of mobile banking platforms, especially considering the increasing prevalence of cyber threats? Yeah, I mean, fraud overall is, is a big topic everywhere. Uh, cyber threat, fraud, uh, all, all these kind of schemes, you know, people, uh, financial literacy. Uh, what, what we are doing is we, we are spending lots of effort, money on uh, financial literacy and uh, on one hand, on the fronting side and on the back, of course, investing a lot in, uh, in technologies, anti-fraud, anti-cyber security kind of uh, threat fraud I mean, uh, technologies. So in this regard, I think it's just about how much you invest uh, of your energy and money to, to build this ring fencing around, around the topic. Otherwise, uh, I don't think uh, anything helps. I mean, it's just uh, pure war, which, which the financial service industry has to win. Otherwise, uh, reputation will be harmed. And we are in the trust business, so we have to make, it, make sure they have it. Yeah. Has anyone on the panel monitored or researched the Armenian fintech market? Are there any ideas as to how it can develop and grow? Everyone's looking at me, but I, I'm a participant in this market. Of course, I've researched it, but uh, it's not, uh, I mean, that's, uh, that's uh, for us to know and, and to exploit. No, kidding aside, I think, um, um, I, I, I think when it comes to AI, actually, Armenia is actually really thriving. Uh, I mean, it, it is surprising because um, um, if you, everybody lives, of course, in an echo chamber and you think that you live here or you, you like this country a lot, uh, that it's a great country. But then if you hear it from other people um, uh, telling you in a very unexpected way, then it actually means something. I think it has a much deeper meaning. And uh, there certainly, there have been articles around that in you know, independent, uh, very famous uh, newspapers. So I think there's really something special here right now. I think uh, what uh, this country has built with their, you know, um, um, political scene and uh, and uh, uh, technology, you know, foundation that they have built here, and also education. I think constitutes together to something special. I think that is a little bit missing is capital, of course, but uh, it seems to me that that is also coming. And what are the prospects of CBDC in Armenia and in other countries? Well, I mean, I think that uh, Koig answered uh, really well on this topic. I think that nobody in Europe or in the U.S. needs, uh, needs you know, to be frank, even blockchain, right? Because trust is centralized, but it's also working. But in uh, countries where centralized trust is not working, and there are many examples of that, right, in the world right now, there a, block a decentralization of trust could actually be useful. Um, I, I wouldn't count Armenia as one of those countries right now. Uh, but there are certainly countries in the world like that that uh, w could really just think of not having a, uh, the role of a central bank in the way implemented um, because it's just not independent and the whole idea of a central bank is independent from politics, right? Um, and, and those countries could think of going through a, uh, through a you know, blockchain kind of thing. The, the one small thing that I would like to add uh, to what you said, and I agree with everything yeah. that you said, is that there, there's one thing with, when you take an euro on blockchain, for example, has just the advantage that you can pay with it in smart contracts. So I think that that, that aspect of it also has some effect, especially when, you call, when we think about IoT, right? Uh, it, it, it could have some effect. Of course, not a, not a huge effect, right? Yeah, and, and I think on, on CBDC, this is actually where to um, amend my earlier comment about it not being appealing because it might not be remunerated, uh, there might be caps on holding, etc. It could actually have a real appeal for citizens uh, and savers in emerging markets. And this actually might be an unintended consequence. So, you know, if all of a sudden you can download from uh, Google Play Store an app that allows you to save with the US Federal Reserve, you might actually see a lot of capital flight from emerging, emerging economies, particularly at times of stress. Now, the right response to that, if you're in an emerging market, is not to put capital controls in place. It's to make your own economies sort of more competitive. But I think this is a risk that if you are a, a bank in an emerging market and all of a sudden the ECB or the Bank of England or the Federal Reserve now offer 
your citizens the opportunity to save, uh, this is a, a, a potential threat with capital flight and also actually even for those financial institutions, how will they manage or even sterilize those capital inflows onto their balance sheet? I think that's something to, to, to think about. Going off of that, and Yara, given your work in investments and strategy in the startup ecosystem um, within emerging markets, how can development banks like EBRD help emerging markets benefit from opportunities like AI? Um, so there's a lot I think that um, development banks can do and a lot that they have been doing, especially when it comes to building with technical assistance and advisory services. Um, helping expand skill sets, um, a lot of policy dialogue that's needed in order to establish um, conducive regulatory systems, um, speaking with <coughs> the regulators and helping them design the type of um, systems that would help the ecosystem flourish. Um, that's in terms of policy advice and technical assistance, as I said, to the ecosystem to uh, build their skill sets in order to prepare them for this big change in uh, the ecosystem. And going off of that, what initiatives do you think are necessary to improve that level of financial literacy, not only in Armenia, but other regions, other developing regions? What type of what, sorry? Uh, financial literacy. How can we improve uh, financial literacy within startups, companies, but also personal? So definitely with um, on the ground programs, I think that's what helps the most. Um, I think a lot more people are becoming more financially literate as the system becomes more integrated. Um, I remember I was sitting with uh, some people at a social gathering and five years ago, you'd never hear anyone talking about their credit rating. Like nobody in regular Egypt, unless they worked in the financial system, understood that we had a centralized uh, national credit system. And now that people are using more um, apps for their financial needs, they're starting to become more aware of what that entails and they're starting to sort of self-educate a lot more. So developing the types of tools and materials that people could access easily in order to help them to do that would be very beneficial, I think. That's amazing. Well, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to the audience in person and virtually for your questions. This wraps our FinTech panel. Great job. <laughs> It's safe to say that fintech is not only a disruptor, but also an enabler. <laughs> Thank you. Now, we have plenty more to come. Please join us for our second live stream, where we will dive into the world of cybersecurity and hear from industry experts like Nubar Afeyan, founder and chairman of Flagship Pioneering, Odil Reno Basso, president of the EBRD, and Jürgen Richtering, the first vice president of EBRD. 